welcome to the Revive to Fierce podcast, your gateway to the ultimate celebration of well-being and vitality. My name is Karen Thompson and I am your host and I couldn't be more excited to take you on a journey that aims to educate, excite and energize. My very first guest on the Revive to Fierce podcast is a dear friend, mentor, and someone who I admire greatly. Dr. Gabriel Lyon is a board certified family medicine and fellowship trained physician in nutritional sciences and geriatrics. She is the author of a new book, highly anticipated book called Forever Strong, a new science-based strategy for aging well. Dr. Lyon completed a combined research and clinical fellowship in geriatrics and nutritional sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. She also completed her undergraduate training in nutritional sciences at the University of Illinois. She is a subject matter expert and educator in the practical application of protein types and levels for health, performance, aging, and disease prevention. She has continued to receive mentorship from Dr. Donald Lehman over the last two decades, to help bring protein metabolism and nutrition from bench to bedside. I'm really hoping that you will enjoy this episode as much as I did. I'm hoping that this episode also educates, energize, and excites you. So here's to making health sexy and fun again. I am so grateful and honored to have you on this podcast that I'm launching um, for the festival Revita Fest that we're going to be hosting. Um, it's such an honor and a privilege to know you not only as a friend, but as a physician and a leader in the, in, in the health space. And I honestly, you know, I got a copy of your book and I haven't finished reading it, but I started reading through it and I'm blown away. I honestly have goosebumps as to just the level of love and effort and information that you put in there like blew my mind. So I'm just going to jump straight into the first question, which is basically just saying congratulations on a phenomenal book. Um, Your book title is Forever Strong, a new science-based strategy for aging well. And in the introduction, you talk about your goal being to overthrow conventional wisdom on the foundation of good health. And so my first question is, what does good health mean? Good health. I love, first of all, I love this question, of course. <laughs> Good health is really about being physically strong. And it's also about being mentally strong. And it's about being free of any of the physical shackles that an individual would carry. To me, that's what good health means, truly. That is a beautiful, simple definition that brings all the core com- concepts together. And so, Another thing that I picked up in the book is that you were very open and honest in the book about describing your personal struggles with food and emotional eating. How Mm. did this shape? And can you maybe go into it a little bit, the way that you work with patients and people? Yeah. So when I was younger, younger, when I was in my undergraduate, I would say that I really developed this dysfunctional relationship with food. And I think a lot of people that are in the nutrition space or in the health and wellness space have had their own struggles. And for me personally, I I studied nutritional sciences and I was obsessed with the quote, right information and whatever that right information was. But what happened was, is I became, I don't know if victim is the right word, but I became very, influenced by some of the more shiny objects, some of the uh, narratives of what health was. And at the time it was, whether it was being macrobiotic or being vegan or vegetarian, but I became very much involved with what that meant, right? And it was a identity for me. Yeah. But what happened was my nutrition became so unbalanced that I was constantly hungry. I was looking for food. I had to get it right. I really struggled with even having a normal kind of going out strategy because I was so concerned about what was I going to eat. And I never want someone to go through that. And I wish that someone had told me when I was in my early 20s, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. There's ways to be healthy. There's ways to develop good habits that are rooted in science. 
Absolutely. And I mean, that is where the book comes in so beautifully. Another quote that I love from the book, and I mean, you can tell that I really am a big fan of this book, is, um, and this is a quote from you, I believe good health starts with the most important muscle of all, your mind. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? People can have the perfect program. They can have all the perfect information, but what really differentiates individuals that are gonna take that and excel is the muscle between their ears, truly leveraging their weaknesses and understanding that weaknesses are not black and white, they are expected. And there's a continuum within every weakness, there is some kind of benefit or strength and really understanding and leveraging an individual's weakness to become a strength is where it is all about. That's so beautiful. This concept that, you know, we look at something as, oh, sorry, that was my son. We look at something as um, negative, right? And we often label things as negative where having this mindset, and you talk a lot about mindset, right? Is having the ability to switch from something that is seemingly bad or negative and create the positive or opposite of that. So I love that you focus a lot on that. Um, After years, uh, and you talk about this as well, after years of watching patients cycle through your practice, you noticed a pattern. While your patients struggled with a wide range of conditions, they suffered from the same core problem, that they had too little muscle rather than too much fat, which is what we've been taught to focus on, this this belief that we have too much fat and it has to just be about fat loss. Why has scientific research historically overlooked the significance of muscle health and its important um, and its effect impact on overall well-being? I I think this is a really important question, and I love that you're excited about it because (laughs) we have for decades been focused on adiposity. And perhaps, and I thought to myself, why is it okay that there's no issue with prescribing obesity medicine, but if someone were to prescribe something that would help muscle, it would be a big deal, right? This is a hormone, testosterone, and it just, the whole conversation is backwards. Why do I think that is? I think number one, muscle is hard to test, right? Uh, yeah. As it relates to how do we routinely test it? We've finally just gotten better at doing it. And, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds at first from a, but from a broad level perspective, it's much easier to test body fat. Yes. It's much easier to identify if someone is over fat versus if they're under muscled. Right. And it's also that we are looking at symptomology. So what is the symptomology that the uh, fat is is generating? Is it inflammation? Is it, um, you know, issues with potentially contributing to cancer risk? All these kinds of things. And medicine at its best is really able to come in acutely and address issues, but it is not root cause focused, yeah. right? So that's why I think that for decades, we've been focused on the wrong aspect of it. And then the next layer to that is as physicians and in healthcare, we become very siloed and we become very good at just executing the standard of care without thinking potentially, maybe we're asking the wrong question and we're trying to fix the wrong problem. And that's why things aren't getting better. Right. Absolutely. And I love that you are shifting this narrative from this and it's genius. I mean, it's just... It's just, it honestly makes me genuinely so happy, which must be weird to a lot of people. My excitement. Well, no, because we, we are friends. So we are friends and yes. you've always been such a huge supporter and just this big ball of uh, brilliant light energy. So there's Aww. that. Yes, well, thank you. I mean, it's just like, it's just such a simple mind sh- sh- mindset shift that I think is going to make the biggest difference mm. in not only individual health, but population health. And not only that, but in the way that physicians are treating or medical professionals, yes. health professionals yes. are going to be treating. That their is the goal. Patients. That's the ultimate goal. How, oh. do we, how do we begin to treat muscle early on? Because, you know, it's not this, this idea that um, we don't have an obesity epidemic. I mean, clearly we do. The question yeah. is, where does this stem from? And yeah. data supports that issues with skeletal muscle, insulin resistance begin in healthy 18-year-old. 18-year-old individuals that are healthy and lean. Yeah, absolutely. It, this is a big deal. It's a huge deal. So, I mean, which... It leads perfectly into the next question, which is in what ways have Americans traditionally misunderstood nutrition and what are the implications of these misconceptions? 
The biggest misunderstanding in nutritional sciences is really discounting the importance of high quality protein. And for anyone who's followed me over a period of time, I've literally beat this dead horse or whatever. But the reality is, is I need everyone's support to be able to get this message out there because there are overarching narratives that discount decades of research. Yeah. And understanding that we need dietary protein and that we need very particular amino acids. There are nine essential amino acids. It's very difficult to get these essential amino acids in appropriate ratios uh, without consuming animal foods. So I would say, number one, understanding that we do have a very robust need for dietary protein, that the RDA, which is recommended dietary allowance, is the bare minimum to prevent deficiencies. Right. You know, the average individual is consuming anywhere between 60, you know, give or take 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. That's that's low. Yeah, that's low. Yeah. So that's the biggest mistake that people right off the bat have. Yeah. And I, you know, I love what that shift creates as well. It's this moving away from this restriction into this allowing us to understand. So it's moving away from restriction and deprivation into a space space where we are focusing on nourishing. And um, I mean, that shift in itself from a an previous anorexic, bulimic, compulsive overeater whose life was focused on restriction to this, it's this growth mindset again that you keep talking about on what can I do to optimize, to nourish, to encourage growth in myself, emotionally, mentally, physically with protein. And so I really, truly love that. Um, the core concept of your work is muscle centric medicine and it's focus on muscle as an endocrine organ. How does this influence aging, body composition, obesity, obesity and insulin resistance? Well, the health of your skeletal muscle really determines the health of the rest of your body, which is different. People often think about skeletal muscle as it relates to exercise or how they look naked, all of which are important. But the reality is, is skeletal muscle as an endocrine organ, meaning when you contract this tissue, it secretes peptides, it secretes these myokines that go throughout the body. They inter, they interconnect and intertalk with the liver and the bone and the brain, the skeletal muscle is an endocrine organ, just like the thyroid is an organ. So the thyroid produces thyroid hormone that then goes to muscle that, you know, we all hear about thyroid and thyroid metabolism, um, you know, as it relates to weight. Well, skeletal muscle, contracting skeletal muscle is also an endocrine organ and it interfaces and is at the root cause of these diseases that we're seeing with aging, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease. So that's what's so important to understand that not only that, but it makes up the majority of our body weight. Yeah. It's over 40% of our body weight. It is the largest endocrine organ in our body. And as you say all the time, muscle is the organ of longevity. Right. And so for people who haven't heard you say that before, what exactly do you mean by it? That muscle, it doesn't matter. So at the foundation, at the infrastructure, muscle is the organ of longevity. It doesn't matter how great your brain is if you can't get off of a chair. Yeah. It doesn't matter, um, you know, how good your heart or X, Y, and Z is doing if you literally have no physical mobility, if you can't go to the grocery store by yourself. Yeah. So muscle at its core, if you want to live, not just about living long, but living in a way that is robust and vibrant, there's no other organ system than is going to nail that for you. It's everything. Yeah. It's more involved than anything. For example, your hormones. Muscle is more important than hormone status. Wow. That's incredible. And that's my opinion. But no. muscle is more important than any of these other things because, for example, when an individual, say, for example, you get sick and you're in bed for a week and you literally can't move, I don't care how great your thyroid is functioning. I don't think great, it doesn't matter how great your testosterone is. You're literally laying there in bed. You cannot move. Yeah. Yeah. That's the quality of life there is non existent. Exactly. And so we're stuck in a society where we're living longer, but we're suffering more. Oh my gosh. 
right. unbelievable, unbelievable. And then do you know that only 24% of Americans are actually meeting their physical requirements for activity? 24%? Yes. yes. And what, what yeah. are the requirements for physical activity? Yeah. For that so when it's, there's a, 150 minutes to moderate to vigorous activity a week plus two days a week of some kind of resistance training. 24% of adults are eating are, are meeting that. Whereas 100% of people eat. That's the other way that we can focus on muscle health. And that's why I focus so much on dietary protein in the book Forever Strong, because if muscle is the organ of longevity and you believe it, that this is what it takes to be forever strong, which once you read the book that you will understand that it really is about how do we maintain and improve the health of skeletal muscle? Well, there's nutritional interventions, which is high quality dietary protein and exercise. 100% of people are eating, but only 24% of people are going to execute exercise. And in fact, you can go your entire life without exercising. Right. I mean, that to me blows my mind. I mean, I'm super active and I love yes, to be out and about, right? So and active and fit <laughs> and tall and blonde and all these things. But that sure. the majority of our population, I mean, over 75% are not meeting those requirements is, is, is sad. It's gross. It's gross. It's, it is absolutely, that's the best way to describe it. It's absolutely gross and um, it needs to shift and change. However, as you said, 100% of people eat. Right. And if there's a small intervention that we can do, a small shift, which is eating more protein, is, which right. we're, you're saying is going to create a huge change, then we should absolutely be doing that. Right. And then, you know, understanding that, again, we think about protein as it relates to muscle health, but these individual amino acids all have different metabolic functions. Yeah. So for example, certain amino acids are really important for gut integrity. Other import, other amino acids are really important for neurotransmitter production, for antioxidant production. But if you hit the needs of skeletal muscle, then everything else falls into place. I love it. I'm curious, what is the thing that you get the most pushback or flack for saying? That you require animal-based proteins without a shadow of a doubt. And this is it's so interesting. This is coming from someone who is a uh, vegan and macrobiotic for many years, which I was that. Um, and there's actually some new evidence. Again, the book you know took two years to write. There's some new evidence coming out now that really clarifies further this need for animal based proteins, that the lower your dietary, your total dietary protein need, the higher the amount that has to come from animal based to meet these individual amino acid needs. So right now we just look at protein. We don't really discuss that there are individual amino acids and how can we create a diet that is really globally strong in these amino acids. That's going to be the next frontier. But without a shadow of a doubt is this pushback of um, an animal based, you know, and I say animal based eating. I don't. I'm very moderate. Yeah, but I am you really are. I am very moderate, but I, I will not stand for the fact that people are talking about that you should go vegan or vegetarian to save the planet. If you care about animals, I get it, but these things are not better for your health. And they're definitely not better for the environment. They are 100% not better for the environment. And I think if anybody needs to dig in deeper, they should go watch Sacred Cow by Rob Wolf and Diane yes. Rogers. I mean, there is a ton of information out there. I think one thing that's always infuriated me is is all these pushbacks in, this, in the community and in the space coming from people who are very uninformed and have very loud voices on social media. And I find it so interesting that I, um, you know, I've been doing, I've been in this space for the, like the last 10 odd years and it's so interesting how loud the voices can be on social media. But when you ask them for a face-to-face -face meeting, there's complete denial or removing themselves from the situation. And so, yeah. you know, I think it's it shows that what you're doing is important and being heard. And so I think, you know, that focus is more important than anything. Yeah. I mean, it's a challenge. It's annoying. You think I want to, you know, hear about it or talk about it at some point? I don't. But here's my concern is that the younger generations have become brainwashed. If the younger generations become brainwashed and they think that plant-based eating is the way for their future, what are they going to, there, there is going to be a consequence. There are going to be unintended consequences to those behaviors and those unknowing. And what happens is, is when you are younger, there is this wave of youth and there's a ton of flexibility, but as individuals age into their thirties and forties, 
if they are misinformed, it becomes very difficult to make any kind of return to health. And number two, the information that then they are transmitting to their children. You know, this idea of a meatless Monday, if that is going to have any impact at all, it's not. So what happens is, is as this narrative gets louder, the people that it affect, the unintended consequences are it affects your grandmother in the nursing home. Yeah. She's going to cut back her high quality protein. Yeah. It's going to affect my child, Yeah. the children in schools and yeah. those on public support. Yeah. Yeah. And what are they going to replace it with? They're going to replace it with processed foods. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's who it hurts the most. And that's why I think that uh, becomes really important that the voice is heard and people understand that the unintended consequences are, are not the people that are in the health space. You guys are going to either do a good job for yourself or you're going to crash and burn. Yeah. But the people that don't have a choice and then you start removing high quality foods, they don't even have a chance. It's not even a choice. It then becomes not even a chance. Right. So they don't have a choice. They don't have a voice. And then they don't have a chance. And yeah. that is disgusting that it's being allowed to get through society in this way. Great. So moving on to the, your three health optimization tracks. Yes, really important. Let's talk about that. Okay. I thought about this for a really long time. Okay. And there are three main uh, tracks in this book that I think are very well thought out, steeped in science, and uh, will do wonders. So I would challenge everybody to just try it and yeah. see what happens. Okay. If an individual wants to live stronger and is happy with where they're at, their body weight, like you, Karen, you look amazing. You don't really need to lose any weight. What I would challenge you to do would be the longevity track. And that would be two meals a day with high quality protein, closer to 50 grams, 40 to 50 grams at that first meal, 40 to 50 grams of that last meal. And then I care less about your middle meal. Smaller meal could be 30 grams of lesser protein. And that's how I would structure your protein. And then carbohydrates are could be a one-to-one -one ratio of yeah. 40 grams of protein, 40 grams of carbs, depending on, on what your activity level is. And you would do phenomenal. And what yeah. happens is, is it's not about changing your calories, but it is about redistributing where your calories come from, how your calories come throughout the day, and the evidence would support that first meal of the day and that last meal of the day before you go into an overnight fast. So it's a great, great, simple way. That's actually how I eat. I love that. And uh, I think it's just a great strategy. And then those individuals that have weight to lose or struggle with blood pressure, blood sugar issues, any kind of metabolic syndrome type stuff, three meals a day of an even distribution of dietary protein is good for blood sugar, It'll allow them to re-regulate. And then the fourth or the third is if you wanna put on muscle. So you're looking at an increased total calorie of 20% or so and uh, four meals a day. I love that so much. Okay, can we talk about breakfast? Because yeah. I know that I think for women, and I could be completely wrong, on your program, you recommend that we eat breakfast within the first 90 minutes of waking up. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Because there's also this huge move, like this intermittent fasting thing, right? Don't, don't do eat that. breakfast, don't, don't do eat. That. Okay, tell me, tell me everything here. There is a circadian cycle. We have a circadian rhythm. The one of those two main entrainers of our circadian cycle, and that is this 24 hour cycle. Uh, rooted in the biology of how we interface within our environment. When you wake up and the sun is shining, this is the time to eat. This is the time you go hunt. This is the time you eat. Then later on, if you're going to do some kind of intermittent fasting and you're eating early, okay, three to five hours before bed. Yeah. Don't fast all day and then eat into the night. Humans, the the information and the data that's coming out is is supporting that you shouldn't be fasting all day that you actually switch that fasting to feeding window you should be eating earlier on and fasting later on and i used to tell people to fast till 11 or noon i no longer tell people to do that 
That's so interesting. And I mean, it kind of supports, I don't know who is it, Walter Longo, maybe not, definitely Sachin Panda stuff about yep. eating earlier on. Um, and so that's been fascinating me as well because I got scared. I got scared of having breakfast. I got scared of eating mm. before lunchtime. And so this is another reset for me where I am challenging my own beliefs. And because I am at that stage where I do want to make sure that I don't lose muscle and even build more muscle, right? Totally. And so I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't have a very protein rich diet. Why within 90 minutes of waking up? Um, well, I think that we have to give some kind of parameter. Okay. Um, you know, and I think that the studies that are coming out really begin to look at that 90 minute window. And, and again, with science, we have to find parameters that we can execute and test over time. I love that. So, okay, I want to shift gears a little bit. One of the most beautiful things to me about your book, and also for me, what sets your book so far apart from other books in the nutrition and exercise space is this focus that you have on mindset, right? And I think maybe it must come from like you being a very driven, focused, goal-oriented person, but also the communities that you work with. I know you work with a lot of special operations, Navy SEALs. And so I just imagine that it comes from there. Wow. But um, you, you're, there's a quote that you say in there and it, and it says, the ultimate life hat is hard work. Yep. You highlight how crucial it is to pair a growth mindset with internal discipline. Mm -hmm. And you refer to this as a growth focused mental framework. Yeah. Let's talk about this concept or the myth that I think social media per perpetuates that life and being healthy should be easy and yeah. come effortlessly. You know, I see all this, these hacks for things and ultimately there is no hack. And yeah. if you care about where you're going, and you really have to put, it's going to be hard and you should anticipate that as something that you invite in. Okay. And where do I see this? So yes, I'm married to a Navy SEAL. Yes, I treat Navy SEALs and special operations in the practice and also some of the most driven and unbelievable individuals in the world. And they have commonalities and the listener doesn't have to be a Navy SEAL or some kind of elite entrepreneur to be able to encode some of this information. There are a handful of things that they do and that I see as kind of this archetype. Number one, there's no narrative, right? They have no narrative about the execution of what's going to happen. There is literally no background talk at all. It's like silent. Seriously? Yes. Yes. It is the weirdest thing. Because you, you know, I witness it in real life. I witness it with these patients. There's, they have no narrative. Wait, wait, wait. I have, you literally have just blown my mind. No narrative. No narrative meaning there's no overriding self-talk with a positive or negative when it comes to the execution. Nothing. There's no, nothing. There's nothing. There's so I, I want to give you an example. I, so I started to see this pattern. So I've been, I've been seeing patients since 2006. And, you know, my real my work with the operators really kind of began 2015 and you start to see these patterns. You talk to enough of these people. And I remember I was talking to a, a commander, Navy SEAL, who's also a patient. And I said, you know, hey, so in the moments in between things, what are you thinking about? You know, when you have, you know, you're going from point A to point B, you're training, you have this execution to do. And he looks at me and he said, whatever I choose. Yeah. And I, and I said, well, wait, do you think about what this person says this and you have to do this? He literally looked at me as if I had three eyes. He said, no, I think about whatever I choose, whatever I want to in that space. Um, yes, these individuals have no narrative. There's no narrative. It purely is execution. It's not some story about how difficult it is that they haven't lost the weight or it's so challenging to eat this protein, literally nothing. And they've trained it out of themselves. There's not a positive conversation and there's not a negative conversation. It purely is execution. And then the other thing that is so interesting um, that we started to work on and that I've seen with some really successful patients is it's not about thinking about the positive. 
people will say, if I don't eat this, I'm going to lose weight. If I don't eat this, I'm going to look good in a bikini if I don't eat this. So people are always trying to motivate themselves with the positive. I would say what's much more impactful is if you think about that space of regret and what it's actually going to cost you if you do that thing. So focusing on the on the consequences and playing the that negative. movie through the negative. On the negative. That is so much more powerful than it's all roses and I'm going to feel great and like it's really zen. No way. I will say, okay, what is this behavior going to cost you? Whether it's a thought behavior, whether it's a food behavior over the next five years of your life. If you continue to do this thing, what is what is the actual cost? For example, if you have an obsessive thought about, I don't know, um, I don't know, pick something. Nobody's going to like me. Yeah. What is that going to cost you over the next five years? Or I'm never going to get a job or I'm never yeah, going to yeah, yeah. fit or just insert your narrative. What is it going to cost you? If you continue to function like that, it, the cost will be so great because it wastes so much time. Or if you have a bad habit, if you think that you're not going to, if you have a bad habit, say with alcohol, if an individual has a bad yeah. habit with alcohol, what is it going to cost them if they drink tonight and then they drink tomorrow night? Because you know, you're going to tell yourself you're not going to have it tomorrow. What is that cost going to be? And then what kind of regret are you going to be living in when it, you know, you get to that three year mark? What is it going to cost you? What is it going to have cost you? Wow, that's incredible. And, and I mean, it makes so much sense because if you're sitting there like if I don't drink tonight and I'm going to and you're projecting what you're going to be feeling. And if you don't then feel those feelings, the disappointment yeah. is horrible. And then that horrible. being clear, you can horrible. fall back onto, right? Horrible. That's how I beat procrastination. So okay, tell I, me about that. When I, um, so after my first baby, you know, it's the first baby, you're getting back into work. And I had a really bad pregnancy. I was so sick for 10 months. Um, yeah, it was terrible. And, you know, when I thought about kind of like these mental behaviors, I just thought about what it was going to cost me, just this idea of procrastinating, whatever talk I had to do or whatever thing that I had to do, or I was writing my book at the time. If I didn't meet these deadlines, what was it going to cost? Yeah. And that was, I was never going to get this book out into the public. That is so much more devastating than the moment of going on the real, real to shop. Yeah. 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 No, thanks. I'm good. I don't. Right. And because the world is going to continue to move. The regret becomes very steep if you don't meet those desires that you have with at least the equal amount of effort. Which, I mean, if we take it back a step, like we have to be so clear on our goals yeah. and our dreams and outlining them in a way that allows us to work to yeah. it. And I have to tell you, that day I lost my job was the most devastating day of my life. I have to say, and there was one person who made that day bearable. I'm getting a bit emotional. There was one person who reached out to me and said to me, it's going to be okay. I want you to go and I want you to outline your dream job and I want you to send it to me and let's create it. And that was you. And that day you changed my life. Oh. And I honestly cannot tell you how grateful I am for the role that you've played in my life, for being such a beautiful friend and mentor, and just for all you bring to the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm probably the person that called you because you probably only told one person. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> but I was a bit of a wreck. But for some reason, one of the people I wanted to reach out to was you, and I did. And I think that was probably the best decision I made that day <laughs> because... I was awful, but anyway, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to make this about me, but I just wanted to say thank you to you for that. Um, and You're how, so welcome. What an and see how amazing Dude, I'm sitting We're here. going to be doing a project together. The whole, like, yes! whatever it is that you want. And so I want to know what projects do you have going on? Because I also know that a part, like a big part of your health, uh, philosophy, if I can call it that is community. 
And yeah. so, um, you know, where does that sit in this space and, yes. and what are you working towards? Well, number one, getting this book out to the world is really important. But number two, which actually you're going to be being the key person, the point person who's going to be helping with me with my first event, which I'm hoping becomes at least once a year, if not, I mean, ideally it would be quarterly, which would be so awesome. But I, as you know, I'm very much a relationship driven person. Yeah. I, I care about people. I really like people for the most part. Um, and <laughs> for the most so, part. For the most part. Um, and so I want to be able to do those things in person. And so after this book launch, that's really the next thing that is going to be happening is an in-person event. This in-person event will likely be in January. And I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm, I just, I can't wait. And then with my podcast, we'll typically, I think that we'll probably pick a few individuals from that I've interviewed that are just amazing and we'll put them on the stage and we'll just have a great time. Sounds incredible. And I honestly am so honored and it's, it's the most exciting thing that I'm going to be involved in. So I can't wait. Um, with your podcast, which has been incredibly successful, it's very, very good. I mean, it's not, it's not easy to interview people for sure. And you do a wonderful job. Who are the highlights? Like what are the highlights that stand out for you either in, information that you've been able to implement in your own life or guests that have had a profound message? What a great question. I don't think that anyone has asked me that. <laughs> I will tell you that my book that I've written is dedicated to Dr. Donald Lehman. I see and, that. you know, he is my best friend. He is my mentor. And I have so much respect for the human that he is and the integrity. And I put him on the podcast, which is funny because we did a ton of videos, but I actually put him on the podcast. And it's such a privilege to be able to share decades of research with him and, you know, to have that to the, you know, the offer to the public to see a side of him that other people don't see, right? Because we're best friends and, you know, for, those out there who know or maybe don't know, academics tend to be a little on the stiffer side, right? Um, and right, and I, I, I tease because we have such a special relationship that it makes the interview and the comfort level of the academic who is Don to be able to really get the, the message out there. So I absolutely loved, I loved that interview, um, and then I. I love the opportunity to interface with people that potentially I wouldn't. So there's the medical side, which by the way, our, the podcast is top, usually lands top three to five in all of medicine in the US, which is incredible. But I have gotten to interview Kelsey Sharon. She's amazing. She's a female gunner veteran who went to war at 19. Individuals like that. Yeah individuals like that that can really tell a story so there's the academic experience and then there's the lived experience and that's what i really enjoy i mean i just i feel just so lucky to be able to interface with people listen in my ideal world here's what's going to happen i'm going to uh -huh. be full-time podcasting i love it we are going to have events four uh -huh. times a year yes the book is going to create a massive impact where the people are going to take it upon themselves to spread the message. Yeah. I will be taking care of a handful of my clients. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty much, and I have a really, I will have a really happy team, which I already do. Yeah. And uh, happy family. And that's kind of where I see things going. I love that. And I will do whatever I can to you. I mean, you are already on this incredible trajectory. Um, when I was just before you got on this call, I was speaking to Jay and I was like, Jay, I have to tell you, I'm the most nervous about this interview because not only is Gabrielle a friend of mine and somebody I love dearly, but I'm also going to be working with her. And also Jay, I think she's going to be one of the most, I don't want to say famous, but the most respected and world renowned experts in the, experts in the space very, very soon. And so this this interview is really a very big deal for me. Um, so I am very just excited. Soon. Like, hey, 10 years in. No, it's fine. It's fine. We got it. We got it. 
So um, anyway, so where can people find you, your community, yeah. become involved, sign up? Yep. Okay. So, well, um, on Instagram, I'm very active. Yep. My team is essential in making me do these absolutely horrible <laughs> reels that I bitch and complain for at least 24 hours. So the team will say, okay, we're, we're going to do this reel and I will bitch and complain for about 24 hours and then, I, and then I'll do it. So you can find me on Instagram if you want to get a good laugh. Just know behind the scenes, I've bitched and complained about all of those things. You um, make it look all elegant and beautiful, so oh, just know uh, that. Yeah, I guess you should do the blooper reels. Um, so there's that. And then they can go to my website in which if individuals want to pre-order the book, I strongly suggest you do that yes. because we've curated a whole bunch of free things yeah. to incentivize you to not be lazy and to do it, right? I don't know about you, but I actually pre-order books all the time, but yeah. this is what I hear is that people do not. And if you wait, you will miss out on some of the amazing, I put together an exercise library, which is really cool. Yes. Oh my God. Totally crushed it. Totally crushed it. it with, I'm sure uh, you did. Carol Lizowskis. It was so fun. Um, so that was, that's awesome. So we're giving that away, which is really, really cool. That was two full days of shooting. Then there's sleep ebooks, and then there's gut ebooks that I wrote with a PhD from Princeton. Just amazing, just amazing, amazing stuff. Then those people who you pre order a book will be part of the Forever Strong community, which, by the way, I'm hoping you guys will all come to the event yes. that we have in January. Um, yes. And then I have a newsletter, and then I have a 30 G's recipe newsletter, which is so awesome. So lots of places. And then, of course, the podcast podcast absolutely well thank you so much for coming on to yes. this show for trusting me as a very new person in the space of interviewing and for the beautiful message that you're sharing with the world i'm so grateful to know you and to work with you and to have you in my life well i feel the exact same way <laughs> and anyone that meets you is so lucky so thank Aww. you so much for interviewing me uh, i can't wait for the book to come out and your support again. I think anything that you touch uh, is gold. Thank you, Gabrielle. You're welcome. <laughs>